So uh, yeah, here we go. So business utility, um, agile transformation. So we're going to have a look at a bit. Uh, look at a bit. The, ma the main thing I'm really going to be looking at is sort of like my experience over the last 26 years or so, um, helping organisations uh, transform to agile. Really, what my practical experience is. We're going to have a look at some. Going to have a look at some models as well. Um, there are lots of different models we can think about. Uh, and in the previous 11 uh, business utility webinars, we've been looking at lots and lots of models. Off the top of the head, we've probably looked at somewhere between 25, 35 models, different models. Um, so yes, business agility, agile transformation. Uh, for those of you who've been on these sessions before, um, apologies again, because uh, I always go through this <laughs> right at the beginning. But for those of you who are new, just to introduce myself, um, my name's Pete, Pete Measy. Um, I'm the uh, RadTAC chairman and founder. RadTAC is a worldwide um, agile transformation training people provision uh, organization. Uh, we're not huge, but we're also not small. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll come on a bit later on to talk about the geographies that we're in. But um, yeah, so I founded this, organ uh, this uh, organization, this company back in 98. And um, I used to be the CEO of RadTAC, but uh, I sort of uh, semi-retired away from that role about probably about three years ago. Um, so now what I do is really work as a transformation consultant, trainer, do these webinars, all sorts of good stuff like that. So founded RATAC in 98. So RATAC's been around a fair while. And um, I started in the IT, IT industry in about 1983. Um, so uh, I used to be an IT expert, a tech, you know, technical practices, all that sort of good stuff. I wouldn't say I am now. I'd say I'm more experienced in business than I am in, uh, than I am in IT. Obviously, you know, uh, starting up a business and growing it to the size that RATAC is now. Uh, yeah, it's really the business experience. So really, I'm an expert in business agility nowadays, rather than just sort of like agile for information technology. So worldwide specialist in agile, lean Kanban, um, being been working on transformations since uh, 94. I actually worked on business transformations before that, but been working on agile transformations since uh, 94. Certified in all sorts of stuff that I won't, train you, uh, I won't bore you with, but things like certified scrum trainer, all that sort of good stuff. Um, I used to be a director of the non-profit organization, the DSTM Consortium, which was one of the um, uh, Agile, uh, Agile frameworks. Uh, that has since morphed into the Agile Business Consortium, who some of you might be aware of. You know, good stuff, good stuff in the Agile Business Consortium. And I'm actually a fellow of the Agile Business Consortium. Um, I was the lead uh, author and editor of the Agile Foundations book um, for the British Computer Society, which is sold very well. Um, if you look at the numbers that sold in the in the top 50 of agile books, so that sold very well. And I used to be an ex adjunct professor of agile project management at Holt University. That's not a real professor, by the way. You know that that's a, a lecturer, but they used to call us adjunct professors when they're lecturers. So that's just a bit of a uh, bit of introduction, a bit of introduction of myself. Um, so this is the twelfth in the business agility webinar series. Um, if anybody is interested in uh, previous um, um, webinars, then they are all on the RadTAC YouTube channel. So just go into RadTAC, uh, YouTube, sorry, search for RadTAC, and you'll see all the previous 11 webinars, all of which are focused on business agility, uh, agile leadership, things like that. Today's um, webinar is really going to be looking at agile transformation. So reminding ourselves of a few things we've had a look at before and having a look at a lot of new stuff. And also, as I say, just to reiterate, really focusing on my practical experience over the last whatever it is, 30 years. Um, so with that in mind, we're going to sort of structure into have a quick look at the need for business agility and um, then have a look at um, what the difference is between uh, agile business transformation and business agility. So I think they're two, two separate things. Have a look at some major agile transformation models. There's loads of these. So we're not going to look at all of them, obviously. Um, how to initiate and achieve brilliant agile transformation across the business. Again, that's a big area that we're not going to be able to go into in depth in uh, an hour, but um, we'll certainly look at some key areas. And then the last bit, which I would suggest is probably the key bit, key lessons I've learned during the last 26 years of doing, of, 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 of doing this sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, why business agility? Again, I'm not. In the earlier webinars, I went into this a lot more. In webinar one and two, for example, I went into this quite a lot. Why, would you, why, why do businesses need to be agile nowadays? especially in the context of the fourth industrial revolution that's happening. Um, if you want to have a look at the fourth industrial revolution, I would suggest have a look at the videos from the World Economic Forum. They will give you a good overview of what the fourth industrial revolution is. But basically, it's moving into things like artificial intelligence, machine learning, remote working, uh, all, all, all these sorts of things. So not planning to go into a great amount of detail here because I don't want to bore the people who've been here before. Um, you know, I don't want to spend lots of time doing this because I've talked about it before. 
Bottom line, why do we need agility in business? Well, it's what's called a VUCA world. You'll hear people in the agile world talk about VUCA. And what they mean is volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. So certainly my business experience over the last 23, 24 years or whatever it is running a business. Um, yeah, uh, you know, 20 years ago, business was unrecognizable to the way it is today. Um, it was a lot less complex, a hell of a lot less volatile, uh, a hell of a lot less ambiguous. So, you know, what's happened with the, the digital um, revolution that we've been going through, where the globalization revolution we've been going through, the fourth industrial revolution that we're going through, the COVID, night, COVID nightmare that we're going through, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It is a very, very volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous world. Therefore, traditional approaches to business, you know, maybe waterfall sort of approaches, you know, analyze everything, design everything, build everything, all this sort of stuff, isn't really going to work very well in that VUCA world. It's not designed for that VUCA world. Um, Agile is very much designed for the VUCA world. So, you know, it's, it's, really, it's really about successful business uh, in, in, into the future. Um, I, I would actually suggest, you know, got to, have a, got to have a Bob Dylan quote in every webinar. So, so you know, the times aren't a changing, times are a changed. So there's a quote there from uh, uh, Cotter, John Cotter, who I'll mention a little bit later on. Um, this is a chap that I would definitely recommend to you to have a read from a transformational perspective. You know, you could almost consider this person to be the dude when it comes to transformation. Um, Cotter um, has produced a number of landmark books. Uh, I suppose his main one came off the back of a white paper that he did for the Harvard Business Review in the late 90s. Um, he was talking there about how things had changed so much by the late 90s and how we all needed to um, we all needed to think about how to lead change. Now, Cotter has an eight-step change process, um, which when you look at it from a helicopter view, might look a bit traditional. You do this step followed by that step followed by that step. Well, actually, Cotter's made it very clear over the last, what, 10 years, I'd say, that, uh, yeah, we need to do these steps, but the steps need to occur in a very iterative and incremental style of delivery. So, you know, even, even the main gurus are talking about uh, business agility nowadays. So the point Cotter is making here is that, uh, you know, things have changed. They're not changing, they've changed. And the one thing you can get pretty well guarantee that, uh, you know, that change is only going to get faster. It's not going to get slower anytime soon. And, uh, you know, arguably, arguably, if there is any positive that's come out of this COVID nightmare, if there is, um, well, the, the speed that we're moving into the fourth industrial revolution now and, you know, the change to working practices has really been turbocharged uh, by that. So, you know, it pushes us even more into the world where we need business agility. And, you know, we all recognise this one, you know, somebody sitting in an office even a year ago, Oh, digital transformation. Don't worry about that. It'll be years before we need to think about that. <coughs> Bang, COVID-19. Whoop, bit of a problem. So, uh, yeah, um, you know, the, 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 these things, by the way, if you want to read more about things like COVID-19, um, these are termed black swans by a guy called Taleb, T-A-L-E-B. Uh, I'd highly recommend read his book, black, black, swan, black, black Swan Farming. The idea of a black swan is that statistically... Most swans are white, obviously. Every now and again, a black swan turns up and we need to make sure that we can deal with the black swans as they turn up, the COVID-19s and other things like this. Obviously, if your organisation is very agile and very flexible, you will find it a lot easier to deal with those sorts of things than a business that is very traditional and very rigid. So, agile business transformation versus business agility. Let's just um, have a look at this. So, this is uh, something that I uh, defined a fair few years ago now. Um, but uh, it, I've mentioned it in previous, in previous uh, webinars, so I'm not planning to go through it in detail, but the way I see things is business agility, you know, lots of definitions for that, but one way to define it is delivering fit for purpose outcomes constantly and continuously improving, or delivering value continuously and constantly. So that's business agility, that's where we want to be, the ability for the business to deliver fit for purpose outcomes constantly and continuously improving to, uh, to our customers. Um, agile transformation is about basically transforming from a traditional business operating model to a business agility operating model. Um, that would typically include descaling the business. And um, one of the webinars, I think it was webinar nine or 10, if I remember rightly, I looked specifically at the scaling frameworks, all the different agile scaling frameworks out there, talked about their pros and cons. But uh, I made the point in that webinar that um, scaling is really about descaling. It's really about removing complexity and making things simple. So, you know, before you think about scaling anything, descale. So agile transformation 
is about transforming to that business agility model. And then once we have that business agility model, we continuously improve. So that's what I see the difference between these, uh, these, these two areas. So we could consider this in a slightly different way. Uh, looking at the left here, we have a pretty traditional um, J curve. So um, the current state uh, productivity and performance will typically go down um, as we go through the learning curve uh, and then productivity, et cetera, will go up until we get to the desired state. Now, we might need to do that. That's sort of like your agile transformation. You are running a risk of a period of disruption, et cetera. However, the diagram I, I have here, the J curve, if you have people who understand agile transformation, that impact will be significantly less. So, so basically, you know, people who understand agile transformation, et cetera, what we're about basically is reducing that impact. So shallowing off that curve. So uh, make sure that, uh, you know, we do things in an effective way. Um, so that might be your agile uh, transformation. Getting, you know, you need to do some work to get to the desired state to, uh, to get to business agility. Um, we'll see a little bit later on that I would recommend that's iterative and incremental, which de-risks it significantly. And then really business agility is more about doing what we've got on the bottom right there. So, um, you know, we want to get uh, small J curves, very low risk J curves. We want to continually improve. So a big feature of business agility is organizations that continually improve. It, it's a big, it's a big sign to say, yes, this organization is, uh, is focused around business agility. Um, fantastic. So, uh, yeah, that, that, that's what I perceive as the difference between the two. Uh, there are some very, very good people out there. Um, in the market who are saying there's no such thing as agile business transformation uh, basically it's all about business agility and I can understand that I can, I can understand that argument you know what they're saying is we should continuously improve um, yeah I agree with that but my experience is that we will need to do some sort of level of transformation to get to that state to get to the point if you look at a very traditional organization they you know they do things in really big ways which is very very risky and sadly most of their transformations fail so we need to change that way of working in the organization, then we need to continuously improve. So it's, it, it's, that, it's that key difference. Let's look at some agile transformation models. As I say, there are loads of these. Um, <laughs> we've looked at a fair few in uh, previous, previous webinars, uh, looked at you know, quite a lot, just to remind ourselves of, of, of uh, this sort of thing. That before I start into this area, as I was suggesting earlier, I'm gonna get your input on things as well, rather than me just jabbering away for an hour. Uh, so this is the first uh, the first thing. So on chat, I'd greatly appreciate it if you could identify, you know, what transformation models have you used or do you like? Um, and if you have references for them, that would be awesome because that's going to help everybody else uh, uh, on the uh, on 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 on, the, on this as well. So uh, yes, if we can have a look in chat. So just what um, what models have you used? Uh, what do you like? So I'm just going to chat now. I don't know if we'll get any get any input on this one because you might not have you might not have used any transformation models i'll just give it a minute to see uh, if anybody actually suggests anything at which point it means i can have a drink now everybody's gone into quiet mode <laughs> oh there we are lean lean change from a value yeah fantastic lean change i would highly recommend um, X scale, I'm not actually aware of, but uh, sounds fantastic and I will definitely have a look at it. So thanks, Haldor. X scale, interesting one. Leanchange.org, yeah, definitely. Um, some or all of you may be aware that uh, one of the core foundations of business agility is indeed lean. So um, yeah, I'll go. Um, X scale, uh, Peter Merrill, M E R E L. Um, we've got a reference here. So yes, I would, I would recommend having a look at that. Uh, Spotify model from Elaine. Yeah, it may not be a model designed for that, but I was in a company where they use Spotify model. Yeah, but I would suggest Spotify model is one of the agile, it's one of the agile models. Um, I'm sure you know this, Elaine, based on what you just said there on chat. Um, but uh, the, the key thing to understand about Spotify model is that was Spotify, I think I'm writing saying in around 2007, 2008. Um, great stuff, really good. Um, but they've evolved since then, they've moved forward since then. And it's arguable, you know, how much of Spotify actually aligned to the Spotify model. However, it is a model. And it is a model I would recommend looking at, but um, you know, just use it with a word of caution when you use it. So awesome, yeah, fantastic stuff uh, raised there. So thanks very much to everybody for raising that stuff. Um, let's have a look at a few. I think that this is a quote I, I always like, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, George Box, a statistician, um, all models are wrong, but some of them are useful. So, you know, I, I, I find it sometimes what happens is 
you know, people like me, um, agile consultants, etc. Uh, sometimes uh, we go into what I would call agile wars. Uh, and what I mean by that is that, you know, we're always arguing that our model's the best model. <laughs> and what I would suggest is that's a bit of a pointless, a pointless thing. Uh, we, what it's about is uh, delivering continuous value on a fit for purpose basis. You know, agile's about that business agility, uh, delivering continuous value on a fit for purpose basis. So it's not about whether I use framework X, Y, or Z or model A, B, or C. They are all useful, but we need to figure out for our organization, taking into account the real culture and the real way our organization works and our market is changing, what are we actually going to do? And that typically will be a mix of different, uh, a mix of different models. So as I was saying previously, we've seen lots of models um, in, in webinars 1311. We've seen culture models. We've seen agile framework models. We've seen power and influence models. We've seen uh, measurement models. We've seen loads of different models, which uh, hopefully if you look at those previous webinars, you know, you have, you'll have a good foundation um, to think about your agile transformation. Um, let's just remind ourselves of a, of a few. Whoops, it would help if I hit the right button. Oh! Um, yeah, this is uh, Cotter, Cotter, John Cotter. This is actually a, a slide from SAFE, um, which stands for the Scaled Agile Framework, which is one of the Agile Scaling Frameworks. As I say, I looked at the Scaling Frameworks in, I think it's webinar nine or 10, if you're interested in finding out more about SAFE under the Scaling Frameworks. Um, yep, Cotter talks about an eight-step uh, transformation process, so I'd highly recommend have a look at Cotter's work. Um, number one, what Cotter says, establish a sense of urgency or remove complacency. What that means is, um, some organizations, you know, they're, they're world, world conquering organizations, they're absolutely fantastic, but they can become quite complacent and they don't realize that things are happening in the market because, you know, they're number one. And um, well, what Cotter suggests is we need to remove that complacency and establish a sense of urgency. You know, sadly, there's been many organizations who've hit significant problems from being number one to dead, you know, Blackberry, Nokia, Kodak. So um, the first thing we need to do in any transformation, certainly in agile transformation, is establish a sense of urgency and understand why, why are we doing this? Um, number two, create a powerful guiding collision, collision, a collision, a coalition. <laughs> and so what uh, SAFE, for example, talks about is a, what, they, what SAFE calls a LACE, which is a lean agile center of excellence to guide the transformation. Number three, develop the vision and strategy. Um, key things to understand here is that it's gonna change. So don't, don't try and develop the vision and strategy to be perfectly correct because you'll never get something that's perfectly correct. Get something that's good enough that uh, communicates our direction of travel, start communicating that and then constantly re-communicate. So communicate the vision very, very clearly. That's about understanding your stakeholders and we'll have a look at that a little bit later on. Empower our employees for broad-based action. Yeah, definitely. We need to think about um, how we're gonna get buying from people. You know, if all we ever do is broadcast and communicate, here's what we're doing, here's where the business will be going, we're never really going to get buy-in. Um, we want employees to be empowered because empowerment equals speed. So a lot of the speed of change that we will be able to implement comes down to the level of understanding and empowerment of uh, the people in the organisation. Generate short-term wins, probably an obvious one. Um, agile transformation is iterative and incremental in the same way that business agility is iterative and incremental. So we need to be generating short-term wins. We need to be measuring those short-term wins and we need to be constantly communicating those short-term wins so people can see that there is tangible, realistic benefit coming out of this. Number seven, consolidate gains and produce more wins. Yep, consolidate everything together, update our vision and strategy, re-communicate, think about the next short-term wins. Win, sorry. And then the last one, which is absolutely essential, that I'll talk more about as we go through, anchor the new changes in the culture. So we can see there we start by the sense of urgency, guiding collision, get the vision, communicate, evolve everything, but we've got to make sure that we anchor these new approaches in the culture. Because if we don't change the culture, what we're doing will just bounce off the organisation. So yeah, that's one, uh, another model. Um, another model, design thinking. Yeah, good model, th good model to think about. So this is a, a RADTAC diagram, RADTAC diagram here. Um, what we're talking about here is our view on design thinking. So we've got discovery and delivery, and not surprisingly, you can see it's very iterative and incremental. So the idea is to evolve the product DNA, or in this case, the business DNA, uh, by doing thinking about things like Lean Startup. Another great book I would suggest you should have a look at, Lean Startup by a guy called Eric Ries, R-E-I-S-S, -S, Eric Ries, Lean Startup. So in other words, start small, yeah, start in a lean way. 
Um, yep, so go around, go around that discovery fan belt or that discovery iterative cycle. Uh, that will inform our business development iterative cycle. Think about visual thinking models so people can very visually see what's going on, what the impact on the business is, the impact on the customer is, and basically keep evolving this round as we go forward. So this is a very good model to uh, think about. Um, we covered this in, was it? I think it was webinars eight and nine, if I remember rightly. We talked about innovation and creativity and we talked about product-based thinking. Um, and we did that with the awesome Stuart Young, who some of you may have heard of. He's a real, um, a real uh, leader in this area. So uh, you can find out a lot more about that in that, uh, in that, uh, in that session. Ratak Key, this, this is what we use basically. Um, again, no great surprise, it's a, an iterative cycle. Um, so the first thing we do is we need to have an understanding of where are we? So what is the current state of the organization? You know, what's happening in the market? Is this organization sinking really quick? Or is it more, more an organization that needs to continually improve to get where they want to be in the future market? What's the current culture? Have we got a very traditional old school culture? Um, is it more of an agile culture? What are the key decide outcomes? Where, where do we want to be in a couple of weeks? Where do we want to be in three months? Where do we want to be in a year? So, you know, what direction are we going in? What's the roadmap to get there within a short iterative cycle? And then choose some pilots. So, you know, we don't want to try and change everything all at once. We're going to choose some pilots. This is what we'd have in our review review stage, adapt stage, consider all the different methods and frameworks, consider what works for that organization based on the review that we've done. Create the agile operating model, so for either for a part of the business or hopefully for the whole business. Um, identify measures and baselines, so we're gonna use that for the continuous communication back. Then deliver, um, do, what makes, do whatever makes sense. That might be a portfolio of training or more usually a portfolio of consulting, training, provision of talent to, act, to act as um, people in the organization who are examplers of working in the way we want everyone to work, and then very visual communication of um, uh, benefits. And then track, measure improvements, track the maturity, continuous communication, then back to review, back to adapt, deliver track, review, adapt, deliver track, review, adapt, deliver track. So it's continuously evolving. So that's another model. Um, this model is specifically for transformational change, similar to Cotter's, which is specifically for transformational change. Okay, fantastic. Um, so let's think about a few ideas associated with great agile transformation. Now, um, you know, what we've been looking at really during webinars 111 uh, through 1 to 11 are all great ideas for thinking about business agility and or agile transformation. You know, we talked about agile leadership a lot um, in webinars 3 through 7. And um, obviously leadership is going to be a key element of creating fantastic agile transformation. But let's just have a look at a few ideas here and then we'll start to get on to sort of like what I've learned over the last 24 years, sort of key, key things I've learned over the last 24 years. So, so we'll look at a few ideas. Before we get here, just to remind ourselves, thinking about um, uh, agile transformation, um, well, why can agile or any other transformation be difficult? So in your experience, what have you seen that has made any transformation from position A to position B difficult. So again, rather than me just talking away, if you could come up with some, uh, some observations here, that would be absolutely awesome. So I'll just uh, move this down and have a look at the chat if anybody, anybody's raising anything. So why can Agile or any other transformation be difficult? Over to you. And again, it uh, gives me an opportunity for a drink. David, yeah, people in business not buying into it, definitely. Elaine, yeah, similar thing, lack of buying from the top. Manoj, yeah, great stuff, culture, people change. Andy, similar to the other two, lack of senior uh, stakeholder buying, definitely. Uh, Shishrindu, people need to change behavior, defo. Uh, Jasbir, people are all different, one approach may not be suitable for all. Uh, Bajal, people that don't like change. Dina, Dina Paul, yeah, mindset, awesome. Yeah, awesome list. And by the way, I recognize a few of those names. Uh, welcome back, those people who have been on, been on previous webinars, so welcome back, folks. Um, yeah, uh, Andy, uh, company objectives may well be conflicting. Absolutely, that, that's, that's a really important point to consider with change fatigue. Um, in other words, you know, I remember, well, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll, I'll name the organization because it was a long time ago, but about 25, 28 years ago, I was working on a, um, uh, a transformation of, business, of British Airways engineering. So this was changing the whole way that British Airways engineering worked 28 years ago. And I remember talking to the, um, uh, the chap who was running that, great guy. Um, but uh, I, I said to him, you know, okay, so we're gonna be thinking about transformation to a new way of doing uh, engineering in British Airways. Um, 
how many um, key objectives have we got? How many key things are we aiming for? And they said, 96. I said, uh, 96, you know, the key, 96 key things we're aiming for. Yeah, 96. Now, I was, I was pretty junior in those days. I still, you know, still highlighted the fact that I thought that wasn't the best idea in the world. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that created a huge amount of change fatigue and also a huge amount of confusion because, you know, no human being is going to be able to take 96 key things on at the same time. Or it's, and certainly no organization will. So we need to be very much thinking about, you know, are, are our company objectives clear? Um, are we not creating a huge amount of noise by having far too many? And do they conflict with each other? So it's an excellent point from Andy there. Yeah, brilliant, great stuff. All right, so once again, awesome. Thank you very much. Some really great stuff there. So I'm just going to, um, uh, just going to carry on with the, uh, carry on with the uh, slides. So yeah, great stuff. So um, just a, a, few, a few thoughts here about um, how we initiate and how we make sure Agile transformation keeps driving forward. Again, I'm going to give you a reference, uh, a guy called Simon Sinek. I'm sure some of you will have heard of. Um, Sinek's actually a marketing dude. Um, he's not an Agile expert. He's not a business transformation expert. Uh, he's a marketing and leadership expert. Um, I would suggest, I mean, he's got a book called um, The Golden Circles. And he's also got a book called Start With Why. Um, I would suggest both are worth reading. But specifically for what we're talking about here, Start With Why. So the point Sinek is making here is that um, what, what, what we need to do uh, is, um, before we get anywhere near thinking about how, how we do stuff or what it is we do, we need to communicate why we're doing it. So, you know, he's talking about organisations like Apple, for example, they are very, very good. They don't talk about, for example, this is how Macs work, or they don't talk about here is what our Mac is. What they talk about is why you should buy into Apple. So that's the key point Synex making. If you want to sell any concept, you've got to get people to understand why are we thinking about implementing this concept, whether that be Apple's portfolio of products, whether that be using Zoom, whether that be doing an agile transformation, whatever it is, we should always start with why. So there's a very good um, short, about seven or eight minutes uh, on YouTube. If you just type, type in start with why, Sinek, it'll come up and I would recommend you have a look at that to get an understanding of uh, uh, really what I mean when I'm talking about start, uh, start, uh, uh, start, start with why. <laughs> okay, um, let's, uh, let's keep driving forward then. Um, another thing you need to uh, get, we need to get our heads around is what the environment is that we're operating within. So we start with why, communicate to people why we're doing this. We then obviously evolve that why message as we go forward. But we also need to understand the environment. Now, I would guess um, some of you or all of you will recognize this diagram. This is the Kinefin framework, framework from the awesome Dave Snowden. Um, so, yeah, we need to understand our environment. Is it complicated? Is it chaotic? Is it complex, simple? Or is it disorder? Because depending on where we are, we'd be using different sorts of practices. You know, for example, if we're in the simple arena, we may just use best practice. We're going we're gonna to do this all the time. This is recognized best practice. Everybody understands it. No, no, no great worries here. If we're in a complex arena, we really need to be emerging that best practice. So in other words, if your business is largely complex and not chaotic, complicated or simple, then we need to be thinking about emerging what the business operating model is continuously improving and continuously reflecting to the market. So it's about understanding what your environment is. My experience is in the vast majority of businesses, uh, you're gonna get all of those things, complexity, complication, disorder, chaos, and simplicity. But largely in businesses nowadays, I would say probably 25, 30 years ago, much of business was in simple. So in other words, you know, we didn't get a huge amount of variability, um, so we could use best practice. I would say nowadays, the vast amount of businesses in complex and complicated and some of it's in chaos and disorder. You know, the COVID-19 nightmare, you know, it's pushed us into chaos and disorder in, in some arenas. So we need to understand the environment within which we're operating and we need to make sure that that which we are defining as a business operating model um, enables us to deal with those environments. So, you know, agile business agility enables us to deal with all of those things, but it's really focused into complex, complicated um, chaotic Kanban or flow models are more to do with disorder and um, disorder and chaos. Um, we also need to be focusing on selling the change. We need to make sure that we're selling the change. Um, transformation, like anything else, is something that people need to buy into. So we need to be able to explain why. Um, there are some good figures on the market. Um, one thing I would recommend you to have a look at um, is something called the Annual State of Agile Report. 
Um, again, you can get that off the internet. Um, this is uh, the 2021 that we're looking at here. So in essence, the way the Agile state, annual state of Agile report works is um, you, you register for it. Um, there's normally sort of five, six, five, six, seven thousand people registered for it worldwide. You register for it. What then happens is you will be sent a questionnaire. You fill in the questionnaire and then a couple of months afterwards, uh, you will get the result. So, you know, the way that all of the 7,000 people who did the, uh, who did the uh, questionnaire, um, what they came up with. So, you know, th this is one thing they normally have in the report. There's lots of different things they have in the report, but this is one benefit of adopting Agile. So we can see here, if we want to sell the change into the organization, we can say, well, looking at other organizations who are adopting, ag adopting Agile, this is what they experienced. And wow, there's some really big messages here. You know, ability to change, manage, sorry, changing priorities in a complex and uh, complex world. 70% of organizations who are uh, doing Agile said that that got better. Uh, delivery speed, time to market, 60% that got better. Wow. Team morale, 59% that got better. Woo, increased team product, et cetera, et cetera. So some really good high-level market-based empirical evidence in this. So I, I would recommend have a look at this because it's going to be essential that as we do the uh, business transformation, we are continually selling it. So think about what's on the market. We also need to continually sell the change with proof. So we're going to be working iteratively and incrementally, always driving forward. It is essentially important to continuously communicate, uh, continuously, continuously communicate the advantages and the benefits that, that we're getting. So people can see that there is a reason for this and especially the senior management can see that they're spending money on something that actually is giving us real tangible, fantastic benefit. So I talked a lot about manage, measurement in um, uh, webinar 11, um, but we need to have a good balanced set of metrics and measurements that we can use to continually sell the transformation. Um, Sadly, um, most in most situations, you know, I've interacted with many, many brilliant business transformation people over the last you know, 24, 25 years, so fantastic people. The biggest mistake I've seen people make is they try and do a big bang transformation. So in other words, you know, they say, well, I can't put anything live and I'm not really going to communicate anything out because I need to have something defined for the business that's perfect before I actually communicate anything. Uh, because if it's not perfect, it will be lambasted and shot down. Um, you know, I, I try and give them a bit of guidance to say Big Bang's not the best idea in the world. Um, and then, you know, three months or six months later, that transformation program gets cancelled because it hasn't actually delivered anything. You know, what we need to do is get things delivered ASAP. Because, you know, in a living, breathing business, we're not going to know whether our transformation is going in the right direction unless we're getting feedback. And we've got to have tangible, provable evidence of the benefits this is giving to keep the continual buy-in. So uh, essentially important, you know, this is, uh, yeah, yeah. Keep it iterative and incremental. I've probably um, done that to death already. Uh, you know, everybody talks about this now, big bang, business transformation, please no. <laughs> um, you are doomed to fail. <laughs> I'll talk about this a bit later on. But, uh, you know, I don't think I've, I'm sure I'm wrong, but I don't remember ever seeing a big bang transformation of any sort succeed anywhere near, um, you know, the sorts of times and costs that the business thought it would uh, align to. Uh, I've seen many, many, many continuous, you know, business transformation to enable the business to be continuous and then continuous improvement. So keep it iterative or incremental, the improvement as it goes forward. But you may well need, in fact, typically you do need, to do some transformation to get there yeah change journey so i'm going to talk about um, a couple of things related to um the journey towards uh, change and the frozen middle so the, the point i'm making here is sometimes what happens is we'll implement the change in uh the people who are doing the job fantastic they will generally get the idea pretty quick because they'll see the benefits and we also communicate the benefits into what i called here layer one the senior management in the organization so they will see those benefits your difficulty uh, can be in the frozen middle. So the, the people who are the sort of like middle, uh, middle to senior level managers, um, you just need to be aware <clears throat> that there's going to be a lot of fiefdoms there. There's going to be lots of politics there. There's going to be lots of smokestacks there. And we will need to find a way to pragmatically bring those people with us. What we don't want is to have those people fighting against us. And I'll talk about that in a, a few minutes. I'll, I'll draw a diagram in a few minutes around that, uh, around that area. Um, Okay, so the frozen middle, just be aware of that. 
Another thing to be aware of is um, when you're thinking about the size of uh, business transformation, um, it's not the greatest idea to try and do everything all at once. The reason being is that you will start to drive a transformation, you'll be successful initially, you'll show some fantastic figures on the transformation, then all of a sudden everybody goes, holy crap, this is absolutely brilliant, you know, I've got to make sure that I'm agile, because wow, look at the figures associated. Then everyone all tries to do it all at once. And what will happen is that will totally swamp your transformation team and it will totally swamp the business. So it becomes like a breaking wave. So your agile transformation gains great weight and credence and then it goes into a wave and <laughs> it then crashes. Now, once you've crashed your transformation once, you're going to find it really difficult. In other words, you know, what I mean by crash the transformation is we've just got far too much happening at the same time and it's all going different directions and it's just becoming a total dog's breakfast. Um, once you've crashed that transformation once, you're going to find it really difficult to reinitiate it. So we really do not want to big bang everything and try and do everything all at once because it will just run away. It'll run away with itself. Yeah. So breaking wave, we need to be aware of that. Um, yep. Uh, change journey can be a long trek over time. Um, change, uh, disruption and resistance. Well, disruption, we need a level of business disruption to drive change. You know, disruption causes change. Um, but we don't want too much disruption that it totally causes everybody to be uh, resistant, but we want enough um, disruption that it causes change to occur. And as I was saying, don't try and do it in a big bang way because you will cause far too much disruption and there'll be far too much resistance. Do it in small iterative cycles. So that's one way we could look at things. Another way we could look at things is sort of like the quick hike. You know, we, we, we sort of like try and do, oh, right, we're going to do everything all at once. Uh, now, this might actually, in reality, this might be the thing that you have to do. Uh, you know, if, if you've looked at the culture of the business, you've looked at where the business is in relation to its market and its competitors, and, you know, it's blindingly obvious that this business is sinking, this might be the thing that you have to do. So, um, but if you do do it, you really do need a huge buy into this, and you will need an extremely exper experienced transformation team to actually drive this sort of drive this sort of thing forward. Um, so yes, a quick hike. Um, yeah, let's just have a quick quick look at a picture. I, I have drawn this picture in previous uh, in previous uh, webinars, so I'm just going to go through it pretty uh, pretty quick. You know, re really, uh, where, where 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 do we want to be? By the way, somebody put something on the Q and A that said fear and uncertainty. That's one of the big transformation blockers. Definitely agree. Uh, def definitely agree with that. Fear of uncertainty is a, a fear of uncertainty is a big uh, blocker. So um, let's just have a quick look at how we might consider um, agile transformation uh, uh, the best way to do it. Oops, Daisy. So what we want to do is here is our business. So here's our here's our whole business, and within our business we have different elements of the business. So we might have a, a marketing team, maybe a sales team, perhaps. Maybe we've got a digital and IT team, uh, admin team, maybe, uh, ex purchasing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Now, what can happen is sometimes transformation is just done within one area of the business. So maybe we, you know, we transform the way we're working, whatever that is, just in, just in digital IT, perhaps. The risk you're running there is it, those, those transformational changes become like antibodies in a body. And what will happen is the rest of the organization will basically act like white blood cells and the rest of the organization will attack all the antibodies because they don't understand why, why it's happening and it's just not the way we do things. Yeah. So it's a very high risk thing to do. And also you're not actually focusing on the bottom line, which is the customer. You know, what, what we're about is delivering value to the customer in a flexible, very focused way. So we don't really want to be trying to change everything all at once because that's big bang and that's going to be you know, a huge risk. And we don't want to be changing in small parts of the business because that's going to be a significant risk as well. So what do we do? Well, what we do is we follow a key tenant of uh, agile thinking. We do what's called vertical slicing. So what you would pick is a part of the business. So let's say this is a bank, maybe. And what we do is we focus on maybe, I don't know, home buying and mortgages, maybe, something like that. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be thinking of a value chain for home buying and mortgages to deliver value to the customer. What we're then going to do is we're going to implement business agility across that part of the business. So in other words, everybody's now working together. Everybody understands why we're doing it. 
we're focusing on it, we're measuring it, and we can measure the real value change down to the customer and get the customer's opinion. Once we've got that tangible factual evidence, we can then start to roll out to the next bit, the next bit, the next bit. And what we're looking for is a concept that's known as, and I think this is a RATAC concept, concept, although we, we may not have come up with this idea, I can't remember, but we call it viral change. What, what, what we want to have is that everybody's understanding the benefit they can see in the other part of the business. We don't want to change, we don't want a crashing change wave, so we need to control what's happening with the transformation, but we use the success of one part of the business to communicate out to the other parts of the business. So we, we create a change wave based on factual evidence, and what we're doing is we're doing small, incremental, and iterative uh, uh, changes. Okay, fantastic. Um, so let's have a think about people change. Um, yep, yeah, this is uh, something, uh, analysis, 50 to 75% of transformation uh, programs fail. Um, that's from a book called Wired to, uh, Wired, Wired to uh, Succeed, which we're going to look at in a minute. Is it Wired to Succeed? I can't remember the name of the book off the top of my head. Wired to Resist. There we go. <laughs> Wired to Resist. So, um, yeah, this, this is from there. So most, uh, most um, transformations fail to launch. They, they don't launch effectively because typically they're trying to do too much all at the same time they fail to scale so in other words um you know trying to do too much all at the same time they lose control and then the uh, crashing change wave happens and then fail to sustain typically what's happened there is they haven't taken into account the culture of the organization and anchoring the change in the culture as cotton the cotton will talk about so why to resist talks about this i would suggest to have a look at this i'd have a look at webinar six where i talked in this in more detail or have a look at the book Different areas of the human brain are all focused into different things, like the, uh, I can never pronounce this, the amygdala, that's probably wrong. <laughs> um, it's the, ah, I'm freaking out, there's too much going on at the time. The in, in, uh, endorenal cortex, oh, I'm lost, what the hell's going on here? Uh, the basal ganglia, oh, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The habanula is very important for agile, actually, I can't mess up. You know, innovation and creativity is about making mistakes, about messing up. But do it in low, a low risk way, and you know, drive forward, drive forward from there. So, um, yeah, people based change. We need to make sure that our change is focused on people. And um, I would strongly suggest you create an ordered transformation backlog. So, in the same way, if you were developing a product, you would have a backlog of what you need to do. Create a community of change. So, the the lace, yeah, lean agile community of excellence, and um, create that. And in relation to our lace, we're going to have an ordered transformation backlog. So, we know what we're going to do first, second, second, third, etc. You need to think about how you're going to put that into an order. There's two ideas here for the sorts of, uh, you know, sorts of graphs you could think about. So the top left one, for example, is going to look at what's the amount of disruption to the daily work, as opposed to how long is it likely to get you, how long will it take people to get used to this change? Obviously, red is probably going to be low priority because that's a lot of effort over a long time. Green would probably be a high priority because that's little effort and it's over quickly and we can we can get that implemented. Yeah. So think about creating an ordered transformation backlog that's essential and then you need to be thinking about uh, how to how to do it um clabnet version one so this is the uh, this is the annual state of agile report this figure came out of the 2019 state of agile report and um, top barrier to agile success is organizational culture so notice the culture of the organization is at odds with the values of agile do it in vertical slices because that's going to happen what you want to bite off is a realistic meaningful chunk of valuable change focused on the end customer and then we've got half a chance of changing our organization culture with with the agile values um good news is that a strong corporate culture um, of any of any type but certainly based around agile is going to give us you know a very significant boost in corporate performance uh, this is from uh, the author of the culture cycle james heskett um, and this also you know sort of backs up what we were talking about earlier from the uh, from the state of agile report and um, just to remind ourselves, again, we looked at this in um, one of the earlier webinars, which one escapes me, so I'm not planning to go through it in detail, but just to remind ourselves, because business culture is so important, um, it's about moving from a command and control culture into a collaborative, um, cultivating and competence culture. So when we think about culture change, it's really moving away from command and control. So uh, we need to think about how to do that. Um, a key thing to remember when we're talking about people um, is is this something I've learned over the years? Um, probably the major reason people resist change is because they, they're focusing on what they have to give up. Oh, this is going to change, therefore I need to give up these things, and that's going to change, therefore I need to give up these things. Now, what are we going to gain? So, just to reiterate what I was saying earlier, we need to continually communicate the positive results 
of the change, the change that we're doing. What, what are the positive results? What are people going to gain from doing this? Yeah, you know, will there be negatives? Probably, yes. Will we have to change what, the way we work now? Definitely. Um, but, you know, focus, focus, focus on the gains. So it's, a, it's key to have a, 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 a really great communication approach based on the stakeholders. Um, yeah, this is um, the Agile Iceberg, again, which I've talked about in more detail earlier on. I'm just going to mention it quickly again. Um, we need to make sure that we don't only change the easy stuff, the visible formal system, but we need to make sure we change the invisible informal system, the culture, the taboos, behaviours, stereotypes, language, that sort of stuff. If we don't change that, the risk is you will change the top of the iceberg, the thing that everybody can see. You won't change the bottom of the iceberg and basically the top of the iceberg will just sink. Now, what's the best way to make this happen? Work in small, iterative, incremental chunks of value focused on the customer, vertical slices and always concentrate on communicating down from the top to the bottom what the benefits are so we are always focusing on you know what are we going to gain we're always focusing on what what we're going to gain and therefore you will pull the bottom along with you so in essence remembering cotter's eighth step in the change process we're going to anchor the change in the culture via communication of those key benefits and those key gains so it's absolutely essential to do that. That's the only way, in my experience, you're going to pull the bottom of the uh, bottom of the iceberg along. It's absolutely essential we do that. So let's move into um, um, key lessons learned. I've shaped these, no great surprise here, I've shaped these into four values and 12 principles. Um, I'm sure we all recognise where that comes from, <laughs> the four values and 12 principles of the Agile Manifesto. So this is this is really my view um, on, on what, uh, on, on, on what these are yes so uh you know if you've got any feedback if you want to email me at a later point and give me your view that would be absolutely awesome but uh, for now uh, number one transformation values well, uh, evolution over revolution we don't want to do big bang change revolutionary big bang change is extremely high risk you might have to do it under certain certain circumstances but they should really be edge cases and um, what we want to do is an agile transformation to get us to the point um, to uh, get us to the point that we can continuously evolve. So we value, or I value, evolution over revolution. Um, I value systems thinking over silo mentality. Um, within a business or old school traditional businesses, quite typically you have lots of different business silos, uh, none of which are actually focused on the customer. Uh, they're all focused on producing a component of what is required for the customer. Well, I really want to focus on systems thinking. How do we make sure that we identify the value chains and we create teams that can produce the features that are aligned onto the actual real customer, what the customer wants? So when I'm going to be doing a transformation, I'm always thinking about systems thinking over silo mentality as a key value. Another key value, we need both transformation leadership and transactional management. Transactional management is what enables the business to run. So the people who are on a day-to-day -day basis managing team X, Y, Z, et cetera. Obviously that management style should be agile in a business agility model. However, for a transformation, we need transactional leaders or transformational leaders, people who can lead. So yes, um, I value transformational leadership over transactional management for the, uh, for the transformation. And then the last key value I've got is empowered people over processes and tools. So we need to make sure that the people in the teams and the people in the business are empowered to make the change themselves rather than for trying to force change on people they change themselves and they can see the factual information to help them make the decision, you know, about whether they should change and uh, how they should change. So those, those are the four values I've learned over the last 26 years or so, excuse me. So hopefully, uh, <clears throat> hopefully some of those resonate with, uh, with some of you. Let's have a look at the 12, I don't want to call them principles, but really 12, 12 things I've learned over the years. There's our normal, uh, agile iterative cycle yeah, based on the OODA loop. So, you know, we need to keep it iterative. Um, we need to make sure flow. Yes. If you understand more, if you, want, if you want to understand more about flow systems, have a look at uh, one of the agile frameworks called Kanban. Well, actually Kanban isn't an agile framework, but have a look at, uh, have a look at Kanban. That will help you think about flow thinking, but that's actually key. So number one key thing I've learned is continuous value of independent maximum valuable business flows. We should really be focusing on that as I've been suggesting, systems thinking, all that sort of stuff. As we do that, continuous delivery of independent maximum valuable business flows, uh, we evolve our transformation strategy. So as Cotta suggests, step two, we need a vision and a strategy, but the key thing is that that evolves over time. And we also need to make sure that it runs at a sustainable pace. If it's not running at a sustainable pace, 
we're going to have that crashing change wave. So, you know, we need to have the empowerment from the senior management in the organization that, hey, look, look what's likely to happen here is we'll start doing this agile transformation and everyone will go, oh, yeah, fantastic. We've all got to do it now. Well, we need to have the buy-in that that doesn't happen. We need to have the buy-in to stop things firing off left, right and center. We want viral change, but we want it done, it. We want it done in a way that is manageable, realistic, and, you know, we, we can actually uh, make sure the transformation sticks. And then a last point, which actually comes from Kanban again, stop starting, start finishing. It is so easy within any, any, within any transformation to fire 8 million things up at the same time. You know, the 96 things from British Airways I suggested from you know, 30 years ago. Um, we really don't want to do that. What we really want to do is start something that gives us significant benefit, finish it, then start something else, then finish it, then start something else, then finish it. The more we have running at the same time, the more likely we are to confuse people and the more we're likely to have huge amounts of noise and that once again, you'll create a crashing change wave. So stop starting things, start finishing things. Um, next one I've learned um, relates to empowerment. Um, so it's rather than just, you know, saying, well, let's empower everybody. Um, it's the appropriate power to the appropriate people. So obviously the implication there is we need to understand who the stakeholders are. We'll come, I'll come on to that in a minute. Understand who the stakeholders are and agree with, excuse me, sorry, agree with them what power works for them and why they need it. Um, a common fallacy with empowerment is that, you know, the management empower the teams. That's not the case. The teams empower themselves. So it's really the negotiation about what, what would make sense from an empowerment perspective and, uh, you know, what, what, what's really going to work. So we need to be thinking about the appropriate power to the appropriate people. Values-based management, we want the uh, clear values, direction of travel, what are the clear values in our business utility direction? And uh, uh, something I'd suggest you have a look at, Dan Pink, um, autonomy, mastery, purpose. So we want to be thinking about when people are empowered, the teams need to be autonomous to do what they think makes sense. They need to be given enough time to master whatever it is they're trying to do. And obviously everybody needs to understand what the clear purpose is. Why are we doing this? So that's the second key thing I've learned, appropriate power to the appropriate people. Um, this is key. This is absolutely key. We need to think about, you know, that there's no point casting seeds of change onto an organization that's not ready for the seeds of change because, you know, it's got change fatigue or there's uh, the, the feeling in the organization is that change never works. Or, or, or whatever it is, you know, the, the, the biggest thing that will not cause the seeds to seed, if that's English, uh, is that people don't understand why we're doing this. You know, you're just casting seeds of change onto an organisation that thinks what it's doing now is fantastic and it doesn't see the reason for the change. So, uh, yeah, communication cued. What I mean by that is it's essential to listen to the organisation and change direction based on what the organisation is telling us. We need to be persuading, not, not demanding persuading we've got to have fast feedback you know if there is one sort of delivery you know thinking about evolving products or whatever it is if there is one sort of delivery that you've got to have fast feedback on it's transformational change you've, you've got to understand what's going on in the business you've got to understand what the implications are so work small iterative incremental get that fast feedback communicate 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 create a transformation pull environment what what i mean by that um, is basically in the perfect world we don't really want to be driving change into the organization what we want to do is create an environment where the seed is ready for the seeds of change so in other words people can see a problem what we then do is we plant the seeds of change that solves that problem so in other words we create a transformational pull environment we don't really want to push change into the organization or sometimes you have to but we don't really want to push change what we want to do is create an environment where people pull the change they pull the change into the business yeah um next one so i've got a few of these so i'll just speed up a little bit um yeah stakeholders so we can see they're obviously a key stakeholder for a, um, a child monkey is the parent monkey um and you know the visualization so we need to collaborate with stakeholders so probably the key thing there is understanding who the stakeholders are so the way radtac defines a stakeholder um is the people or groups who can help us or screw us up the people or groups who can help us or screw us up and I might do a future, a future when our webinar actually specifically on stakeholders and stakeholder management and interaction and communication, because it is such a key area. But we've got to understand who these people are, and then we've got to put in place a communication strategy around those different stakeholders. Um, so we need to implement a targeted visual. We want things to be very, very visual so people can understand it easily. Um, and targeted visual and fact-based uh, persuasion campaign that's continuous and evolving based on the feedback. So collaborate with the stakeholders, think about the effective communication to consistently make sure that um, 
what, what we're doing resonates. Yeah, creative, innovative thinking, learning, um, fail fast, succeed faster. You know, this, this is something that just about every successful business person I've ever read about, I think, makes this point, fail fast, succeed later. Um, innovation and creativity, creating new things, is about failing. Uh, but it's about failing fast, you can learn. It's about failing, you know, in, in a way that's not fatal. If you're trying to do a big bang transformation and you fail, it's probably fatal. Um, so we don't want to do it in small, iterative chunks. So build an I innovative, you know, things are going to be wrong, lean startup, build an innovative learning culture. What we want is lifetime learning. So we look for what are called lifetime learners to help us uh, drive this sort of stuff forward. Design thinking, as we've said, continuously inspect and adapt and making mistakes is, is related to innovation and creativity. Next key thing I've learned. So we've got 12 of these, as I was saying, just to align into the sort of like the agile principles, encourage and visually support transformational leadership. So, you know, the key understanding here is really we want to deliver agile with agile. So therefore we need people who are minded uh, to work in an agile way. So in other words, not doing agile, they're being agile, the way they actually interact with everybody. And, uh, you know, we, in the transformation approach, we want to encourage and visibly support those transformational leaders. Um, next point, some of you may recognise that dude. That's uh, Darwin. Some of you may, may, may recognise this dude. That's Gandhi. So um, I would suggest what these are called are tempered radicals or non-conformist thinkers, transformation catalysts. We want people in the organisation, definitely people in our transformation team, who think differently. You know, uh, in a traditional organization, these people might be seen as a bit of a pain in the ass. You know, they're, they're saying things that doesn't resonate with the way we work. And, you know, how dare, how dare they say things that's different to everybody, the way everybody else thinks. But these people are so important uh, for transformation. So we need to be finding a way to identify these people. And then we need to be finding a way that the organization listens to these people. And, you know, we, we, we push forward in this way. So this is going to be about incubating agile leaders and incubating, sorry, Agile teams. Uh, the next thing, uh, yeah, we need to think about uh, how we're going to plan the uh, plan the uh, transformation. H how we're going to go forward. So really, the key thing I've learned there uh, is this: to understand plans are worthless, but planning is everything. Now, this is this quote is attributed to lots of different people. Uh, Eisenhower is one of them. And um, the point Eisenhower is making is that if you go into a theatre of war, for example, the one thing which becomes meaningless pretty instantaneously is the plans you put in place. But going through that process of thinking about, you know, what's likely to happen, what are we going to do? That's really essential. Um, so we need to create transformation waves, but we also need to recognise that, uh, you know, what, what we put in place is going to change pretty quick. And what we need to do is follow a, um, an idea, or my opinion is we should follow an idea of what's called tipping point transformation. So we've got fast feedback cycles and we're planning at what point does this part of the business tip over into business utility? Or at what point does the majority of the whole business tip over into business agility? So tipping point transformation. We're always doing small incremental changes to get to that tipping point. Next one, embrace simplicity and trust people. I love this quote from DHOC. Uh, DHOC being the ex-CEO of um, Visa. Yes, the person who sort of like came up with the idea for Visa, grew it and et cetera. So, you know, he knows what he's talking about. Simple, clear purpose and principles give rise to complex and intelligent behaviour. Complex rules and regulations give rise to simple and stupid behaviour. So in business agility, we need to bear this in mind, but definitely in our transformation, we don't want to confuse the hell out of everybody and we need to keep it, keep it as simple as possible. I'll speed up a bit just as we're, uh, we're uh, coming up to the uh, end, of, end of time. Um, yeah, anchor evolutionary change in the culture. So we need whatever we do, we've got to make sure that our communication approach and everything else is anchoring the change in the bottom of the iceberg. So this is really a key learning for me because you know I have made the mistake of trying to create transformational change and not anchoring it, and it will it will work successfully for six or nine months, um, and then sadly it will just fall over in a big heap. Avoid cultural entropy. What I mean by that is don't spend all the time and effort moving a new new direction, creating a new direction of travel, and then over time it just falls backwards. So you know it just yeah. So we need to make sure that we anchor that change. So we're nearly nearly at the end now. Um, so, uh, yeah, the next one is about uh, aligning reward systems. Obviously, everything we've talked about up to now, so key things I've learned up to point 10. Well, human beings like reward, so we need to make sure that we align the reward systems with the sorts of stuff we've just been talking about there. So we need to reinforce the good habits, yes, 
and we need to reduce the bad habits. habits sorry. So that's about thinking about uh, reward systems. Now, you know, we're going to have a lot of team-based reward systems in business agility, but there's also, there should also be personal reward systems as well, but just be careful how you do that. And then the last thing to mention really on, on the key learning points, um, and I talked about this a lot when I was talking about um, um, measurement in Business Agility 11 webinar, I think it was. Um, at the minimum, measure value, speed, satisfaction and quality. So that, 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 that's the basic stuff you would measure. And it's the basic stuff we want to be communicating back to the business to say, look, our transformation is achieving this. It has taken us from this point to that point. The basics being value, speed, satisfaction and quality. So th 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 those are really the key things I've learned. This is the key thing I've learned over the last 26 years. <laughs> And um, everything I've been talking about there is agile thinking. So my experience is any transfer. So all the transformations I've run in uh, RATAC and, and labeled in RATAC um, as we've grown globally and all the uh, you know, transformations I've seen in all the other organizations I've, I've worked in, we need to be using agile thinking. Big bang thinking doesn't work. Big bang thinking doesn't work when you're talking about business transformational stuff. So everything I've been talking about here and lots of stuff we've been talking about over the other 11 webinars, that's the sort of things we need to apply into any transformation. And then I suppose the key thing is don't ever give up. I mean, apart from anything else, uh, you know, you can't fail if you don't give up. So uh, transformation can be easy, but generally it's not. Don't ever, ever give up. Yeah, final thought, just from two people uh, I certainly respect, Martin Luther King, you can't fly, then run. You can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But by all means, keep moving. So things are going to be difficult. You know, we need to drive forward and, you know, something from Churchill here. Success, then this is definitely my experience in business and anything else really <laughs> over my career. Success, whatever that means, consists of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. If you don't try things out, you will never know whether something is better or worse than what we do now. So work in small increments, iteratively, based on feedback. So, you know, yeah, it certainly, uh, certainly aligns with my thinking. So that really brings us to uh, the end of... Um, Everything I'd like to talk about here. Obviously, we've just skimmed the surface of a very, very complex subject there, but hopefully that's given you a bit of uh, hopefully that's given you a bit of benefit, um, a few ideas perhaps. Just talk about RATAC. Yes, what, what, what we do is we provide learning and development. We're probably the biggest um, um, company in the world that specializes in agile and learning and development. Uh, help very large organizations of hundreds of thousands of people and you know, small consultancy and coaching, help people actually do this. And then a big part of our business is example of practitioners. So, you know providing organizations with scrum masters or product owners or agile architects or whatever it is they provide so you know the difference here is consultancy and coaching is helping the organization transform example practitioners are people who actually do it so they're examples of you know people working there um yeah training portfolio we've got a huge portfolio of agile training we train in everything agile and um, as i say probably the business probably the biggest in the world uh, we're around the world uh, in uh, all sorts of different areas around the world asia um uh, the states uh, etc etc so uh, we're all around the world. Um, so thank you very much for um, thank you very much for coming along. That's uh, that's really uh, the finish of this webinar. I'll do another webinar uh, somewhere between the next two to four weeks. Um, if you have any um, if you have any ideas for a webinar, by the way, that you'd like me to look at, please contact me, and I'll be more than happy to uh, more than happy to have a look at that. Yeah.